Happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. Happy Happy Father's Day. I kind of forgot it was Father's Day week. I didn't even remember until Friday. It just slipped my mind. But I remember though. So, but Happy Father's Day, and I know after your service, Cassie got some cookies and stuff to hand out to y'all. So be sure to get those. Um, let's pray and we'll get started. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I love you and I just praise you, Lord. I thank you for being the, the best father ever, Lord God. And I just praise you and I just ask, Lord, that you be here with us this morning as we praise you and as we worship you, Lord God, and as we hear your word. And um, just be here with us, Father. We love you and we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So today I'll be in the book of Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 12. And, uh, uh, this sermon, I titled it, Depending on a Lie, uh, and I don't know, just some of the things that I went through for the past couple of weeks, I was just thinking about this, and then I, when I remembered it was Father's Day, I was thinking about, you know, just um, us men, we need to be men of integrity, men who don't depend on a lie or deceitfulness or anything like that, but men of integrity, who do what's right, and who do what's right even when no one's looking, even when we've messed up, to confess our mess ups and move on, right? Be a man of integrity. We shouldn't hide things. We shouldn't keep them to ourselves or I guess you could say try to cover our, our sins and things like that or our mess ups up. Just not make excuses for stuff. Just be man of integrity. Admit when you're wrong and move on. And that's what God wants us to do. And, uh, oh, and you know, the Bible talks about all different kinds of deception and deceit. And a couple of them that come to my mind was like the deceitfulness of riches, the deceitfulness of sin, stuff like that. But today we're going to talk about people who are deceitful and the dangers that go along with uh, being a deceitful person. And uh, Proverbs six, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19 says, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. Out of them set out of them things that he's there's seven things that he says here, three of them have to do with lying or being deceitful. There's three of them. He says a lying tongue and then he says a heart that devises wicked plans. That's that deceitful person, right? They mess up and they're like, all right, how can I cover this up? Let's make a we got to make this plan here to cover this up. And then he said, a false witness who speaks lies. First Peter 2, 1 and 3 says, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And he's saying you, we need to lay aside that, that, that want everybody within them, if they do something wrong or mess something up, Everybody has a tendency to want to, all right, how can I make this sound better than what it is? How can I cover this up? We all do. Everybody has that thought come to their mind. At one point, you're like some people are better than others, but at one point in your thought process, you're like, all right, how am I going? How am I going to deal with this? And, uh, but, but we should never depend upon a lie. And I thought about, you know, why do people lie? They lie to get themselves out of situations. People lie to protect their reputation. They lie out of fear of retaliation of what somebody might do to them if they tell the truth. You know, people think that the truth will cost them something, but it, it won't. Yeah, you might still, there might be repercussions for telling the truth, but there's nothing better than having a clear conscience that I've laid it all out there rather than having something dug down or hit down in you. I'm telling you, if you want to know somebody who used to lie, just come meet me. I used to lie all the time. I used to be conniving and deceitful and all those things. So I know why people lie. I, I understand why some people lie. But we should never depend upon a lie. Honesty always wins in the end. It does. It does. And you got to think. It's funny to me because people, they'll lie to try to protect their reputation. When, when you get caught in that lie, which is probably going to happen, it destroys your reputation. And people don't realize that. They don't they don't rationally think that way, but we gotta understand that. And honesty always wins in the end. And uh and one thing that's always helped me is to to, to learn how to walk and deal with people as if I'm dealing with God. Like view it like that, like God sees everything we do. 
you can bury and hide whatever you want from me or everybody in here, but God sees every single thing you do. And he holds us accountable for that stuff. And people don't look at God that way. A lot of Christians don't even view God with that type of reverence and fear and respect that he is watching everything that you do all the time. He sees. He knows all the dark things, the hidden things, the secret things. The Bible says you can't go nowhere to hide from him. The psalmist said what? I can ascend into the heavens or the lowest parts of the earth. I can go here, there, and everywhere. And you're still there. You see every single thing I do. And God knows our hearts. And so I'm going to look at this story over here in Genesis and we'll, we'll talk about it. But Genesis chapter uh, 12, I'm going to start in verse 10. We're going to talk about uh, fa uh, Father Abraham before he was Abraham. So this was right after God's called him and uh, gave him this promise. In, uh, so starting there in verse 10, it says, Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass, when he was close to, the, to entering Egypt, that he said to his, Sarah, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me. But they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake and that I may live because of you. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. So here you got uh, Abraham. He's He's conjuring up this lie right and and i was thinking about this lie what's what started the whole deal so it all starts in verse 10 it says you got to notice what brings about all this stuff there's a famine right he's he's facing a bad situation he's already went out if you go to verses for this he's went out and seen the land god's going to give him but there's a famine so he's like all right we got to go down to egypt we got to get out of here so, so he takes them down to Egypt. So this bad situation, it was a crisis, a bad situation, maybe he out of fear. They, they come to Egypt. So Abram stepped out of the will of God a while because of a bad situation. That's when most people begin to lie. It's when they get in a bad situation or things ain't going right or the gas prices get up to feel like $20 a gallon, you know, when things, you know, everything's falling apart. That's when people... That is really when people start to lie or be deceitful, to try to manipulate things so that it goes well for them. But it never works out in the end. It never does, and we see that with Abraham. And if you look at uh, verse 11 through 13, he said, he's, he's telling his wife, look, okay, I want you, we're going to make this plan. I'm going to lie to you. You're going to tell them you're my sister. Now, that's true. She was his sister. She was his half-sister. This was his half-sister, so he ain't... It's a half lie is what he's telling me. <laughs> he got this half lie. But a half lie is a whole lie in the end. It is. A lie is a lie. It, it is. I don't care. You can mix it up. You can code it how you want. A lie is a lie. Half lie, quarter lie, an eighth of a lie. It's still a lie. <laughs> it, it is. It's still a lie. And uh, so... So moving on from there in, verses, there in verse 14 and stuff, we see that he actually makes it to Egypt, and it's going good for him. That's the thing. He, he's getting rich off this deal. It looks like he done hit the jackpot. He's like, man, we done made up this plan. This dude's giving me donkeys. This woman's making me rich. I got all these animals, all this wealth. Everything's going good, and it was going good for him. But when I was reading that, I thought of Proverbs 10, 9. It says this. It says, He who walks with integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his way will become known. And we're about to see. Abram's going to become known, and he's going to look like a fool. And, uh, and you know, moving on to 16, right? Abraham gets all, he, he gets rich. Um, and, and one of the things is, Abraham's getting rich, but, but what's scary is that his wife, He's gonna. He's trying to marry his wife, so he's kind of got himself backed into a corner now. Yeah, he's getting money, but Pharaoh thinks he's gonna marry this woman. Like he done took her into his house, and that was the thing he was trying to court this woman. And back then, I guess if you, 
if you had a good looking wife or a beautiful wife, these kings, if they seen them and were attracted to them, the only way for them to get that woman to themselves is to kill the husband. So they would. A lot of times they would have them murdered so that they could get the woman. That's why Abram's scared. It is. That's part of the reason why he makes this up. And that's why he tells them, like, they'll kill me when they see you're beautiful. But he, jumped, he puts the cart before the horse. He's not trusting God to protect him. Look, the one thing is, maybe God told him to go to Egypt. Maybe it was like, okay, there's a famine here. There's food in Egypt. Maybe God told him that. We don't. You, I know I said at the beginning that he stepped out of the will of God there. And maybe he did. But maybe on the flip note, maybe he didn't. Maybe God told him to go to Egypt. It doesn't tell you in the story. You can only make kind of an assumption of it. So maybe he goes there. God told him to. But the lie part is where he really steps out of the will of God. Because he's not relying on him to protect them. Right? He could have just went and been honest, been truthful, and who. You don't know if they're going to kill you or not. Just like you don't know if your whole world's going to fall apart. You don't know. You don't know. It's like these people get in these. They're so worried nowadays about gas prices and interest rates. These people are going nuts. They're falling apart. Like, how am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to do that? Calm down. God will provide. Look, God will look out for you. He will. If you love Jesus Christ and you love him with all your heart and you look unto him, and you follow him, he will take care of you. I don't care how high gas prices get, how crazy interest rates get, if you love Jesus Christ with all your heart and you give him your all, he will take care of you. You might not be walking around with millions of dollars or lots of dollars. You might just be scraping by, but he will get you by. You'll be okay. You will be all right. God will look out for you. He will provide for you. Now, that don't mean you go home and be lazy and say, Pastor Randy said that God's going to look out for me. No, you still got to work. You still got, you got to put in your effort, right? God will pick up the slack. He, he will watch out for us. He'll provide for us. But uh, so, uh, so we see that he's trying to marry his wife. He's backed himself in this corner, but he's getting rich off of it. Off of it. And another thing that he puts in... Uh, in jeopardy here is right before this if you go back up to verse 2 God's giving this promise that he's gonna that he's gonna make him a great nation that he's gonna bless him right he gives him this tells him like many all these nations they're gonna be here's what it says it says I will make you a great nation I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed now he's telling him, look, I'm going to make you a great nation. And we know, understand that he's telling him through Jesus Christ, through the Messiah, is how this is going to happen. And he's putting that whole deal in jeopardy here by lying, by, by doing this lie here and going down here and lying to these people. Because they could have easily killed him. They could have for what he'd done. Now I know God protected him and worked it all out for him. But when you think about it, he could he could have put all this stuff into jeopardy. But I know God looked out for him. And you know what seemed to be a good thing in the short term could have turned out very bad in the long run. But, you know, Abram gained wealth, but he lost so much more. He lost a lot. And I was, when I was looking at this, I found uh, Warren Wiersbe. He lists five consequences of Abram's uh, journey in Egypt and his lie to protect himself. And I want to read these to you and think about them for a minute. The first one he said, there was lost time. The weeks that they were away from the Lord were lost and could not be regained. He said, he's, I mean, just think of that. The, the time that he took to go there outside of the will of God is, is fully lost time. He, he's lost that time now. And that's why the Bible tells us to make the most of our time. Make the, like we should count every minute. We have to make the most of the time we have here on earth. And we've got to make the most of it for the Lord. Every passing second, we should. And we should glorify God. Every second that we have, we should. And I'm not saying that you're supposed to be out there on the street corner holding up signs, evangelizing everybody. But your life should speak to people every minute that, hey, I love Jesus Christ. I know Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian. And it should, it should, it should speak volumes to people. If you believe in Christ and you're filled with this Holy Spirit, your life, that's why the Bible says that we're the light of the world. It should speak to those around you by the way you do things, by the way you handle situations, by the way you over your wife, your kids, the people that you don't like. 
You know, those ungodly folks who treat you like trash or that are bad people. The way you deal with all those people, it should speak to those around you. And uh, second, there was a lost testimony. Abram could never witness to Pharaoh of the true God after deceiving him. After Pharaoh found him out, he could never witness to him. Just, and I want you to think about it. That's the problem with lying and being deceitful. When people find you out, you've ruined your testimony with those people. And that's the thing. It, it just ruins your testimony. And that's why we have to be honest. We have to be truthful. There was, uh, thirdly, when, the fam when they finally come out of Egypt, they brought Hagar with them. Hagar was Sarah's Egyptian maid, and her descendants, the Arabs, have caused has caused the Jews and now the world no end of trouble to this day. All this stuff has come from this one decision. From this one decision. Fourth, they also brought wealth out of Egypt, and this wealth helped cause the dispute between Abram's cattlemen and Lot's cattlemen. And, and you remember that story where they come up and their, their herdsmen are fighting, and they're like, okay. And Abram gives Lot the choice. You take this land or that land. And they had to split up because of so. And number five, Lot developed a taste for Egypt while they were there. The sad thing is Abram's disobedience and deceit adversely affected his family, especially his nephew Lot. And you see that with Lot whenever they get there and they say, pick the land. Abram goes, you can have this land or that land. And he picks the land of where Sodom and Gomorrah is. And let me show you why he picked it. Look at 1310. It says, and Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go towards Zor. See, he's seen that it was like the land of Egypt. See, yeah, Lot's out of Egypt, but Egypt ain't out of him. And all that comes about because of Abram's deceit and what he'd done, how he brought them there. You know, this decision led, and, and not only did it affect, um, moving on from there, but not only did it affect uh, Lot that way, you got to think of the repercussions from, you know, Lot picks that land, but when God judges Sodom and Gomorrah, how much of their family got killed in that judgment? You know, we don't think about stuff like that. The decisions we make, especially when we try to cover up things with lies and do things deceitfully, or just sin in general, you know, they affect our whole family. They affect everybody. And that's why men have to be men of integrity. All of us do, really. Men, women, all of us need to be people of integrity. Have integrity. Be honest with yourself about who you are, about the things you do. you, you got to understand, if you can never be honest with yourself, you ain't going to be honest with God. You can't. If you can't understand who you are, um, I don't know. It, that's a hard one. People have to realize the fact that we are sinners and we need Jesus Christ. We do. We all need Jesus. And when we step out of God's will to lie and protect ourselves, there are serious consequences, not only for ourselves, but our families. And I'm going to read this story real quick. It says, on September 3rd, 1989, Virage Airlines Flight 254 was at Brazil's Maribau airport preparing for takeoff. Under normal circumstances, the hop to nearby Belém would only take 48 minutes. Captain Cesar Garzas consulted a computer-generated flight plan and read the number 0270, which corresponded to the magnetic heading from Maribá to Belém. But Garzas had inadvertently dialed 270 into the horizontal situation indicator. Minutes later, Flight 254 took off and climbed to an altitude of 29,000 feet. Instead of heading northeast toward the Brazilian coastline in the city of Belém, the plane turned west and headed straight toward the Amazon forest. Captain Garces sensed something was wrong. At this point in the fl flight plan, he expected to be able to have visual contact with the Belém airport. Frustrated, the captain, exec the captain executed a 180-degree turn not recognizing the absurdity of his due west, due east course. Having been notified by the flight attendants that the passengers were wondering what was happening, Garces lied. He announced that there was a power failure at the Billum Airport and that he would circle the area waiting for the power to be restored. 
Despite not knowing where he was, Captain Garces informed the barrage flight coordinator on the ground. He estimated the plane would be landing in Balum in five minutes. He then ordered the flight attendants to serve a fresh round of drinks to the bewildered passengers. At 7.39 p.m., when the flight was 68 minutes overdue, the first officer identified the problem and started to explain to the captain his mistake. But the captain dismissed his explanation. Refusing to ask for help, he began counting the minutes until the plane would run out of fuel. All the while, he searched the ground, hoping to find, a, find an airport that he could land the plane. But about an hour later, out of fuel, Garges made a remarkable crash landing in total darkness in a dense tropical forest. The plane was 700 miles from the intended destination. Although all six crew survived, 13 of the 48 passengers were killed. Both Captain Garces and the first officer had their commercial license revoked. You know, all that pilot had to do was admit he had a problem. But in the fact, but in the face of all that stuff, instead of admitting that he was wrong, he comes up with a lie to try to cover up his mistakes. And guess what? People lost their lives because of that. People lost their lives because of that man trying to be, be just lying, just flat out lying. And you know, uh, you know, we just gotta, we have to learn that we have, that we, we have to admit when we have problems and get some help. Instead, so many of us try to cover up our problems and pretend that everything's all right, just like he did. He's like, no, uh uh. I'm good, we're good, I know where I'm going, right? I see, I see people do this at work all the time. You get these people who they think they know everything, right? And they start doing stuff, and you can tell them, hey, man, you ain't doing that right. And it's like, oh, shut up, go somewhere else. And then guess what? They mess something up or they do something that's trashy or junky, and then somebody else has to come behind them and fix them, pick up their slack, all because they don't want to listen. People don't want to listen. They, I don't know. It's pride is what it is. And that's what that guy's problem was. It, if you look at, if you really get to the root cause of that man's problem, that captain there, it's pride. I don't, I don't want to admit I'm wrong. When he could have just admitted, yeah, he might have gotten a little bit of trouble, but I'd rather get in a little trouble than have people's lives in jeopardy. So we have to learn to not depend upon a lie. There's a story in Acts chapter five of Ananias and Sapphira. I think it, I, I was thinking of that when I. Uh, was thinking about this whole line deal, but I think of the just how you know they lied to God pretty much. They they come together. Here we'll read it real quick. We got time. We'll read it. But chapter five, verses uh, Acts chapter five, verse one. Listen to this. It says, "But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds. His wife also being aware of it." And brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was it, after it was sold, was it in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And I think about that story because you read it and it's a harsh story. Like Ananias dies, and then right after that, his old his wife Sapphira is getting carried out. They fall over dead like that, lying to God. And I love, you know, he shows that he, they didn't have. It's like they were lying. They what they were doing was trying to make themselves look better than what they are. I guess like look how much money I'm giving to God. When in return, they kept some of it back for themselves. You know and. They didn't even have to do that. It makes you wonder why people do stuff like that. It's like, why Why you do it? Like, there's not even, a lot of people look at that and it's like, why do you even, what, 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 what was your point in lying there? But like he said, Satan filled their heart. And I don't know, I guess they just wanted to look good or whatnot, but they didn't even have no reason for lying. They could have just been like, yeah, we kept 50% and we're going to give the church 50%. I mean, God wouldn't have cared, right? God loves a cheerful giver. Give, he tells you, give what's intended in your heart. You know what's laid on your heart, you give that. But they lied about it, and they all died. And, and both of them died. It affected both of them. And that's just, uh, it's just, you know, lying, just how it affects everybody. Being deceitful, lying, being 
just living in sin. It affects everybody. And we need to learn not to depend on a lie, but to depend on God to um, deliver us out of bad situations. And uh, He delivered Abraham out of this bad situation, and He'll deliver us out of any bad situation we find ourselves in, especially when we're honest. I'm telling you, God loves people who are honest and it'll just come and say, God, I messed up. Right? God loves that. He will always look out for somebody like that. He will. People who will just open their hearts up to him. Some people do really bad stuff. Even as Christians, they mess up. And instead of trying to cover it up, look, I'm wrong. I messed up. And we first got to be honest to God, but we also need to be honest with the people around us. We do. But like I said, Abraham, uh, God delivered him from this situation, and you see that in the latter part of these verses there in uh, 17 through 20. It says, But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues be because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that this was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, there is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So Abram was in a bad situation. The only one who could have delivered him out of that is God. So it's thankful that God did send the plague and uh, send the plague to him so that he could be delivered out of that whole situation. Because, like he said, I could have took her as my wife. I could have. He has found himself in a real bad situation because of his, because of his lie. It kind of got him in an impossible situation. But we always got to remember that God is faithful, and he's always faithful, even when we're faithless. And he will deliver us out of our troubles, out of our problems. He'll give us the strength to make it through them. And uh, we just got to learn to trust God and not a lie. Another story, there's this guy, another airplane story. There's this guy, y'all ever heard of, heard of Bill, Bill Lear? He made Lear aircrafts. They're, the, they're like commercial uh, business jets. But he's a pretty cool... I've been kind of reading some of his stuff the past few days. He's actually a really neat guy. But Bill Lear, he was devastated when he learned that two Lear aircraft had crashed under mysterious circumstances. He had developed the plane to offer business travelers a fast economical alternative to airlines. At that time, 55 Lear jets were privately owned. Bill sent word to all the owners to ground their planes until he had his team, till he and his team could determine what had caused the crashes. To Bill, a Christian, risking the loss of more lives meant far more than the adverse publicity that grounding all Lear jets might generate in the media. He protected his customers and counted on God to protect the reputation of his corporation. As he researched the two ill-fated flights, a possible technical problem emerged. Bill experimented with his own plane to recreate the same problem. He nearly lost control of the jet in the process, but found that a defect in the plane's mechanism did exist. All 55 planes were fitted with a new part, eliminating the danger. Bill spent two years rebuilding the business, but Lear jets were soon soaring again, carrying thousands of business people safely to their destination. And you know what I think? That's the way to handle a problem. Just being honest. You know, was it probably easy for him? No, that guy has a million, probably billion dollar company selling these custom aircrafts to these business people. I doubt that it was easy to be like, yeah, I we're going to figure out this problem, ground all these jets. It probably made some customers mad too, wanting to figure things out. But like he says, you know, I'm more concerned about the life of these people and the integrity of my business and myself than trying to cover it up because he probably could have tried to cover it up and no tell him what else would have happened. Everything would have probably just went under. And that's what happens when we lie, when we try to cover up our sin. We're just going to go further and further down. Yeah, you can put a masquerade on it for a while, but eventually it's all going to come out in the open, just like with Abram. It all comes out in the end. It all comes out in the wash. And, uh, and we have to depend on God to take us out of Egypt and to take Egypt out of us and uh, and trust God to change change us from the inside out. And that's what he did for Abram. If you go over to verse, chapter 13, look what it says. It says, Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with them to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and gold, and he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning. See? He's brought back to God. 
he drifted from God, but it says to where his tent was at the beginning. He's going back there, back to that place, back to that intimacy with God. And between Bethel and I, to the place of the altar, which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And that's what, that's what we have to do. God brought Abram back to himself, back to a place of intimacy. And the question is, do we long for, for intimacy with God? Do you long to be intimate with God? You know, some of us used to be intimate with God, and then we drift back. Guess what? God wants you to remain intimate with Him. He wants to bring you back into relationship with Him. And just, and you know, we gotta uh, we got to stop living a lie and let God bring us back to Himself. We need to confess our sins, men. We have to admit that we have a problem. People do. If You have to be able to admit you got a problem, and we have to be able to confess our sins. We need to. 1 John 1, 8, 8 through 10 says, If we say that we have no sin, listen to what he says, we deceive ourselves. That's one of the worst types of deception ever is the fact of deceiving oneself because then you're helpless. If you can't admit, like God says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We all sin. We all have sin. We all got problems. From the greatest preacher you've ever known in your life, the greatest man some of you, it's probably your father that is the greatest person you've ever known in your life. You thought he walked on water. Guess what? He was a sinful man just like everybody else. All of us are sinful, and we have to realize that. We can't deceive ourselves and think that we're, we're to this place of just perfect, I guess you could say perfect holiness to where we just don't sin or nothing. We don't. It's going to be a continual battle till the day you die. It is. And we have to repent of it. And look what he says, and the truth is not in you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's Jesus. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I know I quote this verse. Oh, this is my favorite verse of the Bible. And it says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. and His word is not in us. So we have to be, be men, be women that confess our sins. That bring them to God. Don't deceive yourself. Don't lie. Don't depend on it. Don't try to cover them up. Like I said at the beginning, God sees every single thing you do. He knows your heart. He knows your thoughts. He knows all of it. He knows the deep down stuff that no one else knows. God sees it. James 5, 16 says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Don't be scared. Don't be afraid to share your problems with somebody you trust, especially another brother or sister in Christ. That's a good thing to do. People don't do it nowadays. People don't practice it, but it is a good thing to do. And the reason why is because then guess what? Now you have somebody else to help you hold yourself accountable, to look out for you. And like he says, and they pray for one another. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Their prayers and stuff hold you up, help you to get through it. Have people that you can talk to. Don't just try to bottle up everything on your own. Like Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. And we have to confess our sins. You know, there's mercy, there's healing, there's cleansing. When we, when, when we stop living a lie and start telling the truth first to God and then to others. There is. Listen, one last story here. I'm kind of a storyteller today, but this was a good story. So there's a well-known preacher, um, and he has this story. Uh, I'll just tell you, Max Licato, everybody's probably heard of him. I don't listen to him or anything like that, but I just see him everywhere. Like, you Google Christian books, and the guy's name pops up on everything. And But I'll tell you, I don't listen to him. I've never, I don't know much about him. But I seen this, found this story about him, and I thought, now this is nice. But listen to this story. So, Max Licato, he enjoyed beer as a teenager, but gave it up when he realized that alcoholism had haunted his family ancestry. He says, I have early memories of following my father through the halls of a rehab center to see his sister. Similar scenes repeated themselves with other relatives for decades. Beer doesn't mix well with my family DNA. So at the age of 21, I swore off it. Then a few years back, and this ain't been too long ago when he wrote this. It'd be like within the last 10 years. So this guy, yeah, so I'll keep going. But it says, then a few years back, something resurrected my cravings. At some point, I reached for a can. 
At some point, I reached for a can of brew instead of a can of soda. And as quick as you can pop the top, I was a beer fan again. A once in a while, then once a week, then once a day beer fan. I kept my preference to myself. No beer at home, lest my daughters think less of me. No beer in public. Who knows who might see me? None at home. None in, none in public. Public leaves only one option. Convenience store parking lots. For about a week, I was that guy in the car drinking out of the brown paper bag. No, I don't know what resurrected my cravings, but I remember what stunned me. What stunned them. En route to speak at a men's retreat, I stopped for my daily purchase. I walked out of the convenience store with a beer pressed against my side, scurried to my car for fear of being seen, opened the door, climbed in, and opened the can. Then it dawned on me. I had become the very thing I hate. A hypocrite, a pretender, two-faced, acting one way, living another. I had written sermons about people like me, Christians who care more about appearance than integrity. It wasn't the beer but the cover-up that nauseated me. So what happened with my hypocrisy? First, I threw that can of beer in the trash. Next, I sat in the car for a long time praying. Then I scheduled a visit with our church elders. I didn't embellish or downplay my actions. I just confessed them. And they, in turn, pronounced forgiveness over me. Jim Potts, a dear silver-haired saint, reached across the table and put his hand on my shoulder and said something like this. What you did was wrong, but what you are doing tonight is right. God's love is great enough to cover your sin. Trust his grace. You know, I read that story and I thought, wow. Just think about how much humility it took for this prominent, this guy is prominent to come out and just be honest like this. That's God can work with that. He can. That's what God wants people to be honest. Look, he understood, look, just because this guy's high and mighty up in the, I guess, the Christian world, right, view of people, he's still a man. He's still a sinful man. And he's in the fact that he made it right, that's a man of integrity right there, a man being humble, saying, Look, I've messed up, I know what I did, and he found healing in the process. He found grace. And first Peter five, five through six says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For the great for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Don't be afraid. If you got sin in your life, if you got things that you need to get right with God, go to him. Take them to him. Humble yourselves. God will give you grace. He'll give you the power to live above your sin. He'll give you the power to be honest, to be to walk in integrity. But you have to be honest with yourself first. Don't deceive yourselves like that verse said. Don't deceive yourselves. Understand who you are. Take it to God. He will heal you. He'll, he'll help you along the path. He'll give you strength and he'll give you power to be a man of integrity and a man of honesty. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I love you and I just praise you, Father. I thank you for, I thank you for men of integrity, Lord God, men that are honest. I just pray, Lord God, that we all have a heart to be honest and walk in integrity, Lord God, and do what's right even when no one's looking, Lord, holding ourselves accountable to you above all else, Lord God, and not the men around us, but holding ourselves accountable to you. And I pray if there's anyone in here that has hidden sin or that has just issues deep down, Lord, that they need to get off their chest, that they'll bring them to you, Lord God, that they'll humble themselves, bring them to you, Lord God, and I just pray that you'll give them that grace that they so so eagerly need, Lord Heavenly Father. I love you, I praise you, I pray that you bless everyone in here and that you watch over them. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.